thanks to Digital Charlotte. So we better not mess up. That's what that comes down to. Okay, so I am super excited to be talking uh, with four power women, which is awesome coming off of a panel of men. Uh, the idea of local government um, being involved in digital inclusion uh, is has taken on more of a heft lately. Uh, about uh, November 2016, NDIA launched uh, Digital Inclusion Trailblazers, uh, sponsored by Mobile Citizen, um, which is, we came up with a list of indicators, like what do we really like to see in a local government doing around digital inclusion? And those are on our website. Look them up now. We're going to do it, but it would be in their eyes, so that's a bad idea. So um, the indicators are very specific about what it is that a, a local government, city, county, whomever, could be doing to support digital inclusion. So these four ladies are from cities that are doing quite a few of those indicators. And it's clear that local government can elevate the message, can bring partners together, can get the idea and the activities jump-started. And that's pretty awesome. So as NDIA is is you know shifting as to because we're always trying to be flexible and responding to what's going on in the world around us there's a lot going on at the local level so we are very much um, trying to support that and share what's out there this is one way to do that so we're going to start with Ann Schweger from Boston um, what I've asked each of them to do is give just a little here's who I am here's what my job is um, and then they're going to give they're going to ch they've chosen two of the indicators to highlight that they think their city is doing a good job on. Anne, would you like to launch us? Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Angela. And before we start, I would just love if we could all give Angela and NDIA um, and all cultures. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. So now we have Rondella Hawkins from Austin. 
Good afternoon. Thank you all for hanging out next session, and thanks, Angela. Uh, really excited to be here today. Um, Austin, we are really uh, fortunate that we have um, uh, some dedicated resources to digital inclusion. And my office, I'm the, I'm, my role is telecommunications and the regulatory affairs officer, which it is a, we have many multiple um, diverse programs in, in the office. We, for those um, of you that are in states that still have cable franchising authority, um, our office was the cable office. We negotiated cable TV franchises, uh, but uh, Texas cities lost that authority back in 2005. But, um, so we were all about digital inclusion um, back in, in that capacity. My office um, also oversees our, our public access television, community media uh, contract. We partner with a nonprofit. That's also digital inclusion. Um, we we uh, work with a lot of the, the broadband providers, Google Fiber, um, all the cable um, operators. Um, work with the wireless companies, um, small cell. But we also in my office have uh, financial uh, empowerment programs. We uh, monitor the compliance with the payday and auto type. There's a financial inclusion piece of that. And there's some other, other consumer protection issues. So I, um, our office is small. We wear many hats, and we are all about um, advancing, I think, you know, um, our residents, uh, whether it be in equitable access to technology, protection and against predatory lending practices. Um, there's also gas rate making regulatory authority. So I'm, it's a many hats. So, but digital inclusion is one of our you know, core programs, and um, it's taken, you know, many years uh, to get Austin, I think, at this level of where we've got a real focus and we have resources and staffing dedicated to the program. So we are happy to share whatever information we can with any of you um, because we want to lift each other up. Awesome. Now we have McLean Bryant from Kansas City, Missouri. Hi, everybody. what I'm most passionate about. I wish I had more time to do it. Um, but um, in, in a lot of cities, um, a digital inclusion plan kind of drove the creation of a coalition around digital inclusion. In Kansas City, it was the reverse. Um, you often hear saying Kansas City when Google Fiber came or because of Google Fiber and some claim to fame, you know, tech startups or whatever. Um, one of the other things that came about because of Google Fiber's arrival was the heightened awareness of the digital divide. Um, and part of the market analysis that they did was to determine, okay, who can afford high-speed internet? Why can't they? What's the barriers? Um, and once the digital divide became a, a known issue in the city, we had this entire community to coalesce around it. So um, as uh, you know, the city, um, being a leader, um, we were one of the founding members of this coalition you heard from Aaron Deacon, who's also a founding member with Digital Drive. We're uh, fortunate to be well represented in this room. Um, but this stakeholder coalition uh, really pushed the city toward identifying what the city could uniquely do to narrow the digital divide. You know, unfortunately, we're not the boots on the ground practitioners day to day providing literacy training or providing low cost equipment to residents, but you know, there's certain things that the city council can do legislatively um, to help people's lives. So one thing we did was um, we decided to donate all of our surplus computer equipment to an organization called Surplus Exchange that then refurbishes and triages the computers and then makes them available for low-cost purchase to residents pre-equipped with, um, you know, savings to home screens to uh, money smart KCs so that they can, you know, get financial literacy training or uh, applications from, um, you know, the Connect Home Initiative, everyone on GitHub, things like that, so that folks could get uh, digital, digital literacy training along with low cost equipment. Um, so uh, it's, it's something that we're very focused on. Um, the, the coalition uh, really drove us to adopt this plan. The plan we used to really educate our city council as well as the, the mayor and uh, our corporate citizens and others in the community about the existence of this problem. Um, and it also identifies some action steps that the council can take to narrow the divide. Uh, policies such 
such as digital once policies, the creation of a fund um, for digital inclusion, where we're using um, the permitting fees from uh, the different ISPs and that want to do small cell uh, task groups to our polls, um, just different considerations around um, making sure that our open data platform is truly open. Um, what's the purpose of having you know, an open data platform or being a smart city if your residents can't access it? Um, and so the plan is really our attempt to be mindful and strategic as we try to get back to the city's perspective, um, creating new programs, and, and most importantly, supporting the programs that already exist uh, through our, our, our partners. Um, again, since we can't be the ones that actually do it, we want to make sure that we have the finances in place and um, the legislative structure in place and policies in place to make sure that we're supporting our efforts. Thank you. Vicki Yuki from City of Seattle. Good afternoon, everybody. Okay. okay, well, thank you so much for Angela for having us up here. And then um, also, it's, it's amazing that a year has gone by since last time. This is the yeah. first Net Commission conference, and it's great to see um, some really familiar faces and also to meet some really some new people who are doing excellent things in our community. So, um, in the city of Seattle, I work for the Community Technology Program. Um, we're a full time staff of five people who um, are focused solely on digital equity and digital literacy um, programming. And so we're very fortunate. We've been doing this for years. Um, the first person um, would be about 20, about 20 years now. So um, we've had a lot of um, experience kind of growing um, very organically. Um, and so uh, one of the great things about Seattle is that we're a very tech-rich community. Um, several communities out there also are. Um, but um, that's also led to a lot of growth, a lot of rapid growth, and um, the um, community-based organizations are doing their best to keep up. Um, it's getting more and more challenging to live in Seattle, and so um, we're really trying to work hard at developing a pipeline for people to be able to work where they live, um, live where they work as well. And so, um, unfortunately, a lot of low-income people are being um, pushed out of the city um, due to housing prices and stuff. And, um, that all ties back to the ability to um, be able to uh, connect, connect at home, to use um, to use broadband as a way to um, increase and improve your quality of life, um, as well as to participate in government and uh, both at the city and county level. And so um, we do a, uh, a technology access and adoption report that I'll talk about a little later, um, and that's continually shown that there's a very specific a specific band of people who um, continue to not be connected. And um, even as the population grows in Seattle, and even as the um, community continues to become much more diverse, it's still a very specific population um, where we tend to focus our efforts. And so I'm um, really looking forward to sharing that with you, and um, I really appreciate you having us again. Awesome. So uh, I'm going to ask them a couple questions, and we're going to have the panel talk, you know, have a conversation, and then we'll open it up to questions to the audience. Um, so let's talk first about um, what are some of the first steps that you would suggest to uh, a city that maybe has one city council person interested, maybe has one staff person interested, like they haven't quite mustered the oomph that your cities have are at at this point. So what are some smaller steps that you would recommend? I got stuff with the hot potato, so I just make it first. Um, you know, I kind of came in the middle of the process of King City. I was fortunate that there was already a lot of momentum behind this. Um, but at the time that I came on, you know, the mayor was somewhat interested in it, but I don't think it was a priority for the administration. Um, and he kind of relied on me as the policy director to direct them into the areas of the policies that were most germane to the city. Um, and so I just kind of kept on him as that one staff person committed to this and saying, hey, Mayor, this is a basic need. You know, you think about water and utilities and you know, the ability to read and write, this is, this is, this is right there. Um, and so breaking it down to him and you know, to, to understanding that it's a basic need and how it permeates into every other aspect of life and how you cannot excel or even compete in today's economy with 
without digital literacy and access, um, I think the light bulb went off for him. And so we used that same messaging uh, when we presented the plan to the city council. Um, the mayor um, sponsored the resolution to adopt the plan, and we had to hold a series of like three um, city council sessions to educate them and get them on board. You think, wow, this is kind of nonsensical, it's a no-brainer, digital inclusion, duh. Um, but your city council is struggling with so many competing um, needs, and so many people are you know, knocking on their doors and ringing their phones, um, that you've got to get in front of them and just break it down to them um, and explain, you know, it's a citywide problem. Um, while we're mostly an urban city, we also have rural areas. These are the statistics in your urban areas and in your rural areas, your suburban areas. These are the statistics between you know, the different demographics of your population. These are the statistics within your individual council districts. And you, in Kansas City, third and fifth district council people, your folks are going to be left behind. They're already behind, but they have no chance of catching up if they don't have this sort of access. And when you say, hey, your constituents are worried about this, your voters are worried about this, then they have to listen. Um, and not that they don't care, but I mean, that's the type of stuff that resonates with elected officials. Um, and you get automatic advocates when you say, your districts are suffering. Um, and so we found natural advocates in our third and fifth district council people. Um, we then uh, had five community engagement sessions where we went out to the public and said, we don't want to legislate down. Uh, we want to meet actual needs. So, hey, we want to go through this plan with you. It's got five focal points. Um, here are some of the projects that we're currently working on. Here are some suggested product projects. What do you think? Is this actually going to impact your life? You know, what are the barriers for you to actually access these resources? And the primary barrier that we heard over and over again was, wow, we didn't even know you had all of these resources, which is was crazy. So the first thing that we're doing, or one of the first things we're doing is just to have a digital awareness day where we have a panel that's centered around relevancy and resources to talk to residents and say, you know, for those who, this is another, and I'm, I know it's not surprising to anybody in this room, but the number of people who don't understand the relevancy of the internet to their lives is astounding. Um, we had a senior lady who was just like, I don't need it, I don't want it, I don't want your free computer that I want, this raffle is just gonna take over from my living room. Um, so we need to educate people about how the internet benefit their lives. And, um, and then the resources that they have at hand. Um, and so then we went back to the city council, city council for the last time with this actual feedback from the community, then they were like, okay, we're doing this, and they voted for it, and, you know, the entire council voted for it. And we have to say, McLean was successful. Has anybody heard Mayor James speak? She did it. He gets it, and he speaks very eloquently about it. mostly echoing what McLean shared, but um, just to help um, your colleagues, um, your elected officials, you know, everyone who you speak with um, within your local government, to just see how it's foundational to everything that the city says its goals are. So in Boston right now, there are a number of long-term planning processes going on. Um, we would just talk about, you know, okay, well, if economic opportunity, you know, full access to, you know, innovation pipeline types of things are something we're very serious about. We need to address uh, the lack of affordable options um, and access to digital, digital skills. Um, I will say in Boston that it was like fairly easy, uh, given the incredible track record that Tech Goes Home has had in the city um, through Deb Socha, uh, Dan Noyes, Theo Hanna, uh, where, you know, for a number of years, I want to say over a decade at this point, um, they've worked in partnership with the city. They've worked with schools, housing authority, community centers, senior centers, libraries. So even before I started um, a year ago, or a year and a half ago, um, a lot of the language about the importance of this and the understanding that it is foundational was already baked into how people, um, you know, viewed priorities. 
So um, I've been with the city for many years, and I was around, um, this was pre the time where we reached a tipping point, like broadband access is essential. So, you know, we were, um, as staff, a couple of us, um, looking to get resources uh, for, for this digital inclusion thing. And you know, we 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 actually were able to hear the voice of the of um, the councilwoman. Uh, I mean, it's really critical that you have a champion um, on your on your council because they have the, the, the power to allocate funding and resources. Um, but again, getting back to we you know, we helped actually create our Austin Freenet, which is our nonprofit that operates the public computer labs. Um, so we did have you know dedicated dedicated um, staff person to that and. Um, opening up the public computer labs and the libraries. Um, but then it's just, we have a citizen advisory commission, which is our, our, tele, our community technology commission. You know, you want to reach out to all the champions that have some sort of political help, uh, political connections, but also all your service providers, your neighborhood, um, neighborhood groups, and just, you know, this is an essential, essential that, that there be some level of support and funding and resources dedicated for, for your digital inclusion programs. Um, yeah, I think having, you know, a, a champion um, I, on the council, I think that's really, really important. And, and we have been successfully, I mean, over the course of 20 years. Yeah. I mean, we now have, um, you know, we have a digital inclusion team. Uh, we have, um, I, under my office, I have four, um, four dedicated staff members, and John Spears uh, is our digital inclusion program manager. You've heard about all the various programs that we had. Um, and then our library has two dedicated uh, digital inclusion staff members. But uh, one of the programs that, uh, our, our Grant for Technology Opportunities program, I, I want to just uh, lay it out there that back, I guess it was about 17 years ago, I was the, digital, I was the program coordinator and I saw this technology matching fund program in Seattle. So I, I as a staff, I, I brought it to our commission, our citizen advisory commission. I was like, we need to implement something like this in, in Austin, right? And, and successfully was able to get that commission to pass a resolution to, to the city council uh, to fund it, and, and it's been funded ever since. So it's just like, making those, you know, connecting the dots and connecting the people and, and using it some civic, civic minded, civic participation nonprofits. Um, I mean, you just lay out the landscape and just, I uh, just keep, you know, keep pounding the pavements. <laughs> so you have to be like Rondello, is what she's saying. Yeah. <laughs> Tenacious. <laughs> Absolutely. I think there's, um, I think there's a lot of power to building coalitions and building community, um, finding those trusted leaders within the community. We have a lot of different languages that are spoken in Seattle. And um, those community leaders are incredibly powerful. And oftentimes, you know, even though, yes, the city has this, they don't always, the citizenry doesn't always trust the city, you know, and so to give them, um, to provide the things that they think that they might need. Um, and so we try, I generally, we generally try not to speak to people, but really try to get, engage the community at large what it is that they feel that their digital um, equity needs are, or where are the gaps that you see because that's the reality, right? I mean, we can do these surveys and we can um, collect data from, um, you know, nationally and locally and see how they correlate. And that helps us get funding and it does all these wonderful things, but really, you know, in order to get those services out to the people and then to create things that continue to be um, important to them, you know, is also to include them in your planning. And so, yes, we do have we do have a number of staff, but we didn't always. And um, I think that the best, growth that we've seen in our efforts has been where we've really engaged community members, other community-based organizations, um, even and then possibly even other municipalities, so, um, or other, um, not municipalities, but other institutions. So like the colleges, the, the public schools, the libraries, um, housing authorities, like I mentioned before, but I really think that, you know, if you don't, if you're not at a point where you have a dedicated staff, powerful things still happen in those communities, you know, and I think that that just speaks to the ability that you have to be able to connect with um, your uh, trusted leaders as well as your community members. Awesome. Since we have two mics, I'm going to walk around with this one to get our questions from the audience. Who says I need to stay on the stage? 
So first question for our fabulous female power panel. Really? Where? Catherine always saves the day. Good afternoon. Um, Catherine Craigo from the Housing Authority of the City of Austin. So I think it's, it's wonderful that we all here believe that when that, that city door turns into a web portal, that the city has some obligation to ensure that everyone can get through that, that web door, that internet door. Um, and, but when we go out to corporations, we're often asked to make the business case for investing. Um, many of these corporations know exactly um, what their ROI is. They know how much it costs to sell somebody a pair of socks online versus in a store. You know, Bank of America knows exactly how much it costs to make a deposit through a teller versus offline. Um, you, and many of us who flew here, we, we met the red coats at United Way or American Airlines that are just there really to teach you how to use the kiosk so that they don't have to use the expensive labor to get you on your flight. Um, what possibilities are there for um, requiring companies who <clears throat> maybe have branches, <clears throat> bank branches, or other kinds of, provide other kinds of services, even contracted by a city, requiring those organizations to provide digital literacy training as a way to help get folks online and make it, make it more cost effective for all of us? try to get corporations involved in digital literacy training, but we have been getting them involved in just digital inclusion more generally. Um, for example, Mayor James gave a speech at Tech Week Kansas City a couple years back, and he really called our corporate um, citizens to the table and said, hey, you innovators, you startups, you who are successful in raising VC capital and coming up with new ideas and new solutions to, you know, cure all the world's ails, I'm putting it on you to come up with solutions for this problem as well. Um, we are also um, a tech hire community. And so we saw tech hire as a way of marrying workforce development with digital inclusion. Our workforce development organization gets funding from the state to uh, provide apprenticeship and internship to folks 16 to 24. Our digital inclusion practitioners need additional manpower and would appreciate not having to pay for it. And so we structured, uh, I think it was a 10-week apprenticeship at our digital Inclu inclusion coalition practitioners like uh, Connecting for Good, which does digital literacy training, and they also provide low-cost refurbished computer equipment so that folks in this age group could get paid internships to work at this organization and learn how to do this work. Um, and then become more employable once the internship ended. Um, we've got corporate citizens that come to us all the time and they would like to build relationships with City Hall. And one way that they do that is by finding the things that our legislators are interested in and then also becoming interested in those things. Um, and when we were first embarking on Connect Home, uh, we were approached by a company um, interested in doing some small cell attachments, and they asked what the priorities of the city were at that time, and we said we're doing this Connect Home initiative, and there's a gap. You know, we've got um, ISPs that are able to provide connectivity to uh, the you know multifamily housing structures in our housing authority, but nothing for those that are in our Section 8 and scattered sites. And so, Mobility and Sprint ended up mobility and whatever uh, ended up donating um, mobile Wi-Fi that could be checked out of the management offices of the buildings and out of the administrative offices to these residents that weren't otherwise getting coverage. So you just gotta think about ways that can be helpful and then ask for it. Those are great examples. Anyone else? Partnerships with businesses? Panel? Uh, yeah, this is in Austin. Uh, we're always uh, seeking out partnerships with um, corporate companies. I mean, we, we have, we're tech city, so we have a lot of technology companies um, and a lot of startups and a lot of, I think, kind of so social entrepreneurs and um, socially minded um, ones at that. And, and a couple examples, I mean, our, um, there's a lot of private sector participation in that GTOPS 
program because of matching funds. We see a lot of nonprofits who partner with the private sector. Um, we partner with Google Fiber. Uh, we got the new connections um, in the city and public nonprofit facilities. Uh, we are seeking, actually, we just recently had a roundtable with uh, some private sector businesses on how they can get more engaged in our digital inclusion program uh, rather than just like, you know, like the one or two that are, are our most prominent. Um, we're exploring that relationship and uh, we've got our um, Digital Empowerment Committee of Austin, which is that citywide collaborative committee that our office convenes um, with whether it be service providers, nonprofits, but also the ISPs, broadband companies, and getting them, you know, involved in that conversation and how and how they can help. So, I mean, we're all about seeking out partnerships, and our mayor is very strong, um, is, is a really good convener at that, too. Um, one of the ways that we were able to engage in Seattle is when we were doing our digital equity initiative. We launched that in 2015, and um, we created a digital equity action committee, which is made up of corporate, um, as well as nonprofit and community-based organizations and community members. And those, that group's work, as well as the focus groups that, and roundtables that they participated in, um, it actually informed them a little bit more. I mean, a lot of people who came to the table are already digital equity or digital literacy champions, but it really made it abundantly clear that, you know, yes, you're participating here, and we have expectations of you, you know? So you participate here, and then we are very, um, happy to hear what you have to offer and to promote some of those things where it's um, feasible, but um, sometimes just even having those types of convenings and being able to have communication around the actual issues has led. So we were able to get, um, for instance, um, Google, con Google was part of that conversation and they stepped up and they're like, we have some funds available and so that's what's gone to fund the, our, our Connect Home efforts. And, in terms of um, free broadband at home. And so it's, I don't know that we would have necessarily been approached about that if they hadn't been participating within, our, within that sphere. But we have um, lots of uh, opportunities. There's lots of tech companies in the area and startups, and, but um, that doesn't always mean that they fund solely in your area, and so you really do still have to sell the need. So those of you who have dedicated staff, um, can you talk about where, where does the money come from? Is it general fund? Is it from franchise agreements? Um, for us, it's our cable franchise fees. Um, the cable franchise fees um, funds um, the majority of our programs. So that includes our technology matching fund grants, our um, device distribution. We, have, um, we give out between 100 and 200 um, devices a year. Um, two programs um, supporting um, digital literacy training, um, and then uh, our tech access and adoption report. So those cable franchise fees are great. We've really funded our programs, but you know the revenue is not staying pretty steady there. <laughs> so there's concerns. So we have been looking at alternative sources. Um, but for the most part, that's where our funds come from, as well as some general funds. And then you can use the revenue that you get from their use of your public right of way to make sure that your residents can actually use that critical service. So it, it's a very virtuous cycle that um, sounds like a number of us have uh, derived great benefit from. We would encourage you all to pursue that as well. So in Austin, all of our 100% of our cable franchise fee right of way revenue goes to general fund, and all of our other utility revenue as well. But our our Positions are more general funded, so the um, my office the four positions is general funded, as well as the uh, library staff is general funded. McLean, could you talk about Rick's position because he's done a lot of work on broadband? So Rick is assistant city 
manager, um, Kansas City, we got weak mayor, and supposedly mayor's office is supposed to be strictly policy driven, although there's nothing weak about our mayor. Um, and then the city manager handles the administrative side, and so Rick Usher, um, he is the assistant city manager for entrepreneurship and, and small business. Uh, so while he is not an FTE dedicated solely to digital inclusion, he has found a way to incorporate it into his work, and he devotes a lot of his time to it. And so uh, he and I have really tried to frame it for the rest of City Hall to, just to understand how digital inclusion touches on everything. Um, and so we have open data conversations, and we have smart city conversations, and we have you know small cell attachment conversations, whether it be with public works or conversations about CDBG with our housing department. We want to make sure that digital inclusion is top of mind for everybody. Thank you. Any other questions? Hi, uh, Sam Patrick, City Utility Board. Uh, this sort of uh, dovetails off what you folks were just talking about. I'm interested to hear uh, from each of you, and I'm pretty familiar with Boston, and I'm pretty familiar with Seattle. Boston's my hometown. Seattle's my sort of next neighbor living in Portland. But governance structure and what works and what does not work. And uh, being familiar, I think, with Boston and Seattle, you know, you've, you guys have large sort of innovation offices under which, and they serve sort of as an umbrella, I believe, and sort of you have all these components underneath them. And I don't know much about Austin, I don't know much about Kansas City, but could you guys talk about uh, the extent to which the governance structure in your respective cities sort of helps to elevate this work? although he's more so focused on innovation and smart cities, and so we work pretty collaboratively with him um, just to ensure that you know, there's a, always an inclusive aspect in that. So for example, when we were applying for that, that big Cisco competition, um, we came up with the idea of providing free Wi-Fi along our Prospect Max line, which is a bus rapid transit line that runs down the, I think it's the second most traversed, you know, road in, in Kansas City. Um, kind of similar to what we did on the streetcar line with Sprint and Cisco offering free Wi-Fi on the streetcar line. We wanted to expand that into a more urban area so we'll have greater reach, um, particularly for those that are most impacted by the digital divide. And so um, all we had to do was mention, hey, this includes the digital inclusion aspects to this. Let's uh, have the internet reach five blocks east and west of the bus rapid transit line so that libraries and other public institutions can benefit from that free inter internet and then residents can benefit from that as well. Um, and so it's, it's kind of a collaborative process because it's not the main focal point of our innovation office, but it's definitely one of them. Um, our innovation office uh, came up with a digital roadmap, uh, I think it was like four or five years ago, that incorporates digital inclusion as well as like smart cities and open data. So it's, it's definitely a, a Okay, so um, so our office, Telecom and Regulatory Affairs, where uh, I think we work cross departmentally in a, co in a coordination kind of coordination way. Um, I mean, we started out with a digital inclusion program, um, and a couple years ago, uh, we have uh, we got our chief innovation officer um, who actually helped to facilitate our um, development of our digital inclusion strategic plan. So that office served as like providing certain consulting services to us and developing that plan. Um, more, and we work with our IT department. Um, they are, all, they operate the city's public Wi-Fi, um, although it's, it's definitely antiquated and needs updated, but for the connectivity and also uh, our office is working with them on our um, re-allocating uh, some of our recycling, our, our PC refresh and our laptops and PCs. Um, and we just more recently have a chief equity officer. So that's going to add another, like, you know, not layer. It's going to be, I think, we will be working as an interpretive departmental team. Um, so that's kind of what our governance structures. And I don't want to also, the, 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 the Citizen Advisory Commission, the Community Technology and Telecommunications Commission, um, they, um, we went from an all-at-large city council, mayor and city council, to uh, at-large mayor and um, single-member districts. We went from like to 11 
islands. We expanded the number so each you know, district is represented uh, represented on that commission. And we really, as a city staff, and all the multiple departments work closely with that commission and really help to, I think, champion and represent the residents and the neighborhoods and our policy making and where the needs are. And again, they can help um, send a message to a council member, you know, if there's a, some, some assistance or help, help is needed. So in Boston, um, you know, so there's um, Mayor Martin Walsh, and um, our CIO reports to him. So our CIO is Joshua Franklin Hodge. He leads the Department of Innovation and Technology. I work within that department. And then in my role, I work across many departments. Um, so just thinking like Public Improvement Commission, Boston Planning and Development Agency, Boston Housing Authority, Boston Public Library. So there's like the, we certainly fall under a, like a very set you know, type of governance structure, but then the way we go about our work is, is quite fluid. Um, we could, it could be a very formal collaboration that's you know, a, over a project over the course of a year. Um, the way we work together could just be like learning each other's language. So it was a huge win a couple months ago when um, my colleague Amy Cording in the Public Improvement Commission, um, who's an engineer for Pitt, uh, offered some critical assessment of, you know, the value of um, web browsing in public kiosks on, you know, sidewalks. And that's fantastic. Um, you know, whether or not, you know, a city goes that direction, it shouldn't just be the digital inclusion person or persons raising those issues. Um, there are decision makers who can move things forward and ask, you know, really important things of large groups uh, that, you know, you can't be in every single meeting. You need the values of digital inclusion and equity um, to be infused across you know, all departments, ideally. Any other questions? Laura. <clears throat> so three of the cities up there have been at this for a long time and have, you know, been through several generations of programming. I think Kansas City's a little newer, but what advice would you give to a city that hasn't really found its way to a formal commitment to digital equity or an office of digital inclusion or that kind of thing? I mean, what's, is there a secret sauce? Where, where do you go? How do you start? And what ingredients do you need to have there? I, I think that our secret sauce has been, and I gotta give a lot of credit to, to Rick, because Rick Usher, manager is the one that has indoctrinated me in all things digital <laughs> um, But he and I have worked really closely with our, our coalition and it's having these practitioners that are every day working with folks and holding us accountable and city what can you do and city we need some money and city we need less red tape and city you know and, 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 and being willing to make those progressive you know, forward-thinking adjustments to city policy um, to make sure that as, you know, technology is evolved, that we're, you know, on the front end rather than the tail end making the necessary adjustments. Um, you know, having a mayor or a council advocate, as, as Angela said, is, you know, it, it can't get anything better, more useful than that. Um, and city staff is committed to it. I wish we had an FTE. We've got, it's included in the plan. We just don't have funding for it as of yet, but we're working very hard toward it. Um, and I think, a, I think a coalition is necessary for any community, but making sure that you have the right people at the table in that coalition. Um, every day in meetings that Rick and I take that are wholly unrelated to digital inclusion, we're like, hey, Alpha Point, you employ uh, the visually impaired, and we could really use you as to formulate ideas and policies around distance working. We'd like to introduce you to the head of our full employment council so that we can create distance working opportunities for folks. And there's state level funding for uh, the equipment necessary to uh, make a visually impaired person able to use a keyboard and, and whatever. And so how could we, you know, as using the mayor's power to convene, bring all these resources to bear? Um, you know, I, I think the coalition really is, is like the most valuable piece, at least it has been in Kansas City. I think there's um, a secret sauce. I think there's like a um, 
about, you know, how how can the city do the best job it can do in investing in technology skills development and a technology literate community and citizenry, you know, and part of that's like how how so I mean working within our council structure and our we have we have a count, our council as a technology subcommittee. We um, also do a lot of work under Mayor, of course, because he's the big boss. Um, but the, um, our community technology advisory board, we have a mayor and um, council appointed board, um, which, which drives a lot of our work. Um, they communicate with us regularly and um, bring, those, bring those issues to the table. And so I think that, you know, kind of finding those champions within your, within your agency, um, as well as those people who are in your community who are willing to come and speak to different departments. Um, we work interdepartmentally on some issues, and so that's been really helpful for us. Because even though we are staff within the city, that doesn't mean that every department or every um, organization is interested in implementing the strategies that we've put forward. And so really, even if they are staffed, by um, staff to do this work. It's, it's a continual conversation and ensuring that they understand the importance of having a tech literate and tech, tech connected um, population. It's really my two cents here. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, digital access equity, I mean, is now a foundation. It's a foundation of everything that the city and the community it's called communication, service delivery. Um, and the ingredients, I think, are advocates and um, leadership. And, you know, just one or two people can start reaching out to whether it be the Literacy Coalition, I mean, nonprofits, um, your um, libraries, and you just, I don't know, you just kind of keep, keep, you know, keep the momentum and keep, we, we, need, we need these resources, we need a digital inclusion program in our community because there's, you know, there's lots of now data and studies and research out there that shows why this is necessary and, um, and I think the ingredients is, and, and there's, everyone in this room has, has the advocacy and the passion behind this. So. Okay, I think it's time to wrap it up. Thank you so much. We're going to give a big round of applause to our panel. You guys can head on off. You're done. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Laura to, to give the final goodbye. Um, one more thank you to St. Paul Public Library. And um, we need to give a huge round of applause to Amanda Feist. who's been running all over town, setting up computers, making sure all this was ready for us. So thank you, Amanda. Um, and I'm going to hand it over to Laura, uh, our fabulous board chair. Thank you. We're not really a board, and so I'm not really the chair, but I'll go with it. Um, so we hope to